Welcome online family. Welcome in person family. We just welcome you here today. Let's give a hand clap for our online family. Online family, let us know where you're watching this from, where you're watching from your home, if you're from a different state. Put in the comment section, in the comment section where you are watching from. Uh, someone just told me it looked like I just came from the beach. Amen. I'm ready for spring. No more cold weather. Praise God. Well, I'm glad you guys, I, I'm so glad that you made it here today. Give yourself a, a round of applause for those of you who are attending here in person. Online family, why don't you give a, a round of applause for the people who are making it here in person. Put a comment, say uh, a hand clap, whatever you want to put on there. Um, guys, today we're going to conclude the Bless series. Uh, I want to encourage you, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person, to take notes. What's the difference between hearing the Word of God and Bible study? When you're in Bible study, you take notes. There's a quote, the, longest, the shortest pen is, is longer than the longest memory. And obviously, many of us don't use pens or pencils anymore. But whether you, the method is a phone, whether it's paper, make sure you're engaged and, and what is being said here uh, today. This message God gave me a couple of weeks ago, and I actually was going to minister it a couple of weeks ago, so I, I, this, is not a, this is something that God has released me to, to share here today, and I believe it's a challenging message, and it's a, an empower, empowering message. You know, one of the things that my mom would tell me is, as a leader of the home, she would tell me, my responsibility and, and my duty is to not give you what you want, but do what's best for you. And sometimes what I wanted and what was best for me, they overlapped. They were the same thing. Uh, but sometimes they were not. What I wanted and what was best for me were not the same thing. Nevertheless, she told me, I'm always going to do what's best for you. And, and it's not what I, what I want from you. Because my mom did not manipulate me. She, she would tell me it's what I want for you. I want you to mature. I want you to grow up to be a young, responsible man. I want you to have the, the best life that you can and maximize your potential. That being said, I, I'm here today to, to, to teach you uh, what I believe is best for you if you are rooted in this church, if you call yourself a Christian. Uh, and, and sometimes that may not be what you want, or sometimes it may be what you've been wanting to hear or to understand from the Scripture. But nevertheless, uh, I believe God is, this is, has told me this is what's best if you're a Christian. Uh, and, and, and we're going to conclude the Bless series, and it's about giving. But as a pastor, I, I am not just concerned. So many times, just in general, we hear so many sermons about giving. But what about, what do you do with the rest of the money that after you give? See, you can, you can put God first in the area of finances, and you can give. You can give 10%, but you can mismanage the 90%. And, and, and I care not just that, that you give, but I also care about what happens afterwards because I, I want to make sure that you're empowered, that we don't mismanage, but that there can be multiplication. And how many of y'all know some leftovers where you can be a blessing to other people and your family and to friends? So I'm just going to tell you a story. Uh, my mom had the option as a single mom. She didn't get child support, so she had the option government gave her. She says, either you don't work, and we give you a lot of food stamps. <laughs> and, and back then, there was no WIC card. It was the, the color money food stamps. How many of y'all remember the color money food stamps? I used to be so embarrassed about those, those food stamps. My mom would always make me pay with them. You know, never, it never failed. Every time I was going to go pay with someone, I always ran into people I know. And like, hey, wh what's that color money you have in your hand? And like, anyways. My mom had goals. She said, look, I, 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 I want to go to college. I, I'm, she was a director at a daycare facility. She had goals. So she's rather than not work uh, and get more food stamps, she chose to work. And she got less help uh, because of that. It was even harder for her. Um, so she became a master uh, of, of stewardship. She made, uh, and one of the ways she did that, one of the many ways she did that is we never wasted leftovers in our home. Um, if, if she made arroz con pollo on Monday, there's a 100% chance we're eating arroz con pollo on Tuesday, <laughs> arroz con pollo on Wednesday, arroz con pollo 
on Thursday. A anybody have a mom like that or, or know what I'm talking about here? She, she balled on a budget. And, uh, and sometimes I'll say, Mom, I, I don't want this. I want, you know, McDonald's. You know, or I want something else. I don't want, you know, leftovers. She said, well, if you're hungry, then you're going to eat it. If you're not, that, I guess you're not that hungry if you don't want to eat it or you're going to starve. So she gave me the ultimatum. But, but she didn't waste the leftovers. We always maximize the leftovers and we put them for future use. And I want to use that as an illustration that to say this, this principle, that it's just the leftovers are just as important as what you give. So what we give unto God is important, and how we manage what we have left over is just as important. So what's more important? Both are important. It's important that we put God first in the area of finances, while at the same time it's important that we manage what we have left over. If we can go to our main text, Matthew chapter 14, verses 19 through 20. And if you haven't done so online, family, or in person, go ahead and reshare this with somebody on your personal Facebook profile. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 19 through 20, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then, the breaking, then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And I want to point your attention to this. Look what it says next. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 back baskets of leftovers. Someone say leftovers. Yeah. Ate and was full. And the Bible said they even had leftovers. Leftovers. In other words, and they didn't waste them. They put them in baskets. For future use. So even Jesus, we see in this narrative here that it's just important how we manage the leftovers, just as what we give. Both are important. Giving and putting God first in the area of finances is important. But how we manage what's left over after that is also important. I want to give you three ways on how we can manage, be better managers of the leftovers. Number one. You cannot have leftovers without first bringing order to your finances. Matthew chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. The first thing Jesus did before he brought multiplication was he brought order to the situation. Jesus is a man of order. Jesus operates in order. This was not sporadic. This was not a free-for-all. It was not chaotic. Jesus said, sit the people down. The Bible said he used strong language. He commanded them to sit down on the grass, and he put them in groups. He said, sit them in groups. He said, now give me what you have. And a kid, a young kid, brought the two fish and five loaves, and then after there was order, then Jesus began to multiply. If you are going to see multiplication in your finances, if, you're, if there is going to be leftovers, financially speaking, you first got to bring order to how you save and how you spend and how you are managing your money. Until then, it will always be disorder. And when there's disorder, God cannot flow and function through that. When there's disorder, there can be no multiplication. When there is disorder, there can be no leftovers. But how many of y'all want to have some leftovers? How many of y'all want to see multiplication? It starts by putting God first. And for some of you that know about how you put God first, let me ask you this, are you practicing it? It doesn't matter what you know, it matters what you do with what you know. The difference, knowledge is information, wisdom is the application of that knowledge. Are you being wise and are you applying what you know about the Scriptures in the area of giving? Is your life in disorder, your finances in disorder because of your overspending and under saving? Living beyond your means. Or maybe your life is in disorder because you thought you would be making a certain amount of income all your life and you were blindsided by a, an unexpected situation or crisis and now you find yourself making less. I want to encourage you, no matter what the situation is, you, the first step in bringing order to your finances is by putting God first. 
Some of you may say, people who tithe and people who give a lot, it's because they make a lot of money. A a any tithers in here can say, that, that's not, that, that, that's baloney. <laughs> because tithing is not an about amount, it's about a percentage. Whether it's 10% of $2, 10% of $20, 10% of $2,000, 10% of $20,000, tithing is giving the tenth. In fact, the word tithe, it means to give 10%. It's a tenth of whatever you make biweekly or monthly. It doesn't matter the amount. What matters is that you put God first. And how do we do that? By through the area of tithing. A couple of, uh, about three months ago, I participated in a raffle, and I, I sold $40. I think it was $20 a ticket. And if I won, I would get the choice between a brand new uh, Xbox. What's, what's a new Xbox called? God, there's a lot of anger in that. Ser Series X. It was either Series X or $600. And I'm, guys, I'm not the raffle type of guy. I never played in, uh, in a raffle or even won, and I played, and to my surprise, I won the raffle. And they said, what do you want, the, the Series X, and, uh, <laughs> or do you want the $600? I'm like, I'm not 21 years old, 20 years old. Give me the $600. I'll take the $600. But I could have not received anything had I not sold anything. And what I received back was way more of what I sold. And the point I'm trying to make is Scripture promises in Malachi chapter 3.10, don't take my word for it, research in your own time and your own devotion, bring the tithes and the offerings into my house, and I will pour you out a blessing you will not have room enough to receive, and I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Read the Scriptures in the New Testament, give unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, but give unto God what is due unto God. Read the New Testament where God says, where you give unto him, he will give back to you, pressed down, shaken, and overflowing. God always gives back to us more than what we gave to him. But you cannot expect to receive if you've not sown anything. And too many people say, I'm going to heaven. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I talk in tongues. I read my Bible. But are you sowing? Is God first in the area of finances? Are you being like the little kid and bringing order and giving God the little that you have. And when you, how many of you know if you give God the little that you have, He'll multiply. He'll do much more with your little than you could do by withholding it. He can do a lot with your little, but it starts by putting Him first. <laughs> Tithing is not an American concept. You hear messages like this, and people say, oh, that's a prosperity gospel. That's an American thing. That would not work in third world countries. Where do you think the Bible was written in? <laughs> America, guys, did not exist when the Bible wrote, when the Bible was written. Or that was a Ten Commandment thing. Genesis 14, verse 20 shows us the first time someone tithed. Abraham tithed. 600 years before Moses lived. 600 years before the Ten Commandments were given. When you tithe, it shows your heart condition. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, Where your wealth is, there will your heart be. Meaning, if you want to see if God really has your heart in the area of finances, look at your giving. Look at how your finances, see if, if you are giving. That will tell you. Don't look at how many scriptures you know. Don't look at how much knowledge you Look at your giving. That will tell you whether or not God is first in the area of finances. It's interesting that some Christians will profess to have faith, to believe in God, that God will take care of them for eternity after they leave this earth, but don't have faith enough to believe that God will take care of them on 90% if they would trust them with 10%. How many of y'all know there's a contradiction there? Tithing breaks the spirit of greed. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, money is the root of all evil. Does it say that? What does it say? The love of money. Because money in itself is not evil. The Bible says he's blessed us to be a blessing. 
But you can't be blessed if you're always, you can't be a blessing to other people if you're always broke. You won't be a blessing to people if you always mismanage your money. But when you tithe, it shows God, God, money is not my God. Things are not my God. You are my God. The world standards are not telling me how I'm going to manage my money. The Bible, I embrace the biblical view, and I put it to practice, and I'm going to allow the Bible to guide me on how I manage my money. So it breaks the spirit of greed. And when I mention the world, I'm not talking about a geographical location. Uh, I'm talking about a way of thinking as Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, be not conformed to this world. That, wor that word world is a way of thinking that is anti-Christ, anti-Bible. You can be Christian and be anti-Bible. So it's important that we always embrace the biblical worldview and we apply it, whether it be in marriage, whether it be how, it, how we should raise our children, or in the area of money management. Number two, what you do with the leftovers is just as important as what you give. Once again, true biblical stewardship is not just about giving. It's how you manage the leftovers. We see Jesus and his homeboys here. El Chewy. With a sick beard. And they're not being wasteful with the leftovers. They put them in baskets for future use. But once again, part of being a good steward is not just what you give. It's how you manage what's left over. How many of y'all know God has not called us to be wasteful with what's left over. So how do you budget your leftovers after you tithe? I'm going to be real practical here, guys. Look at your bank statements. Look at three to six months of your bank statements. Track every dollar. Look at where your money is going to. Looking how, look how you are spending every dollar. If you take your car, they're not just going to start, once you take in your car, they're just not going to start fixing it if it's breaking down. What do they do? They do a, a diagnostic. They assess it. And if you want to get to a place to where you have leftovers or there's multiplication, you start with where you're at. And you got to know where you are at financially first if you want to get to a certain level to where there's leftover and you have multiplication in the area of finances. Part of looking at your bank statements is for you to determine, is the majority of your money going towards needs or is it going towards wants? See, there's a difference between needs versus wants. Oh, my God, I got to have this new purse every week. It's a new purse, Gucci. How many, is that a, a need or a want? I got to have this new gun, the $2,000 AR with this type of scope, need or want. I already have a car, but I just got a little bit of raise. I got to get a new car, need or want. I have uh, the, the, the new retro Jordans just came out. I need to get them, need or want. <laughs> For the teenagers, it's a, it's a necessity. Guys, there's a difference between needs and wants. There, there are certain things that we think we need, but they're really just wants. I promise you, take my word for it, you will not die if you don't go eat out every week, if you don't have a new clothes every week or new month, you will not die if you don't get the latest car. But you know what will die or what's already dying? Your pocketbook. And I tell you this out of love, especially if you're married, because one of the number one reasons why marriages end in divorce, it's not the devil, it's not unfaithfulness, it's finances. Finances have wrecked more marriages than probably the devil has in unfaithfulness. So, what is a necessity? A roof over your head? Food? And of course, clothing. I mean, God don't want us walking around Adam and Eve. 
utilities, insurance, health insurance, life insurance. These are necessities. And everything else, and of course, how many of y'all know we cannot pr- forget, first and foremost, putting God first. And I know some of you, Pastor, you don't know what it's like. Mexican, please. I drove the same truck. Got, rest in peace, La Bumblebee. 2003 Chevy Colorado. Paid off. And the first instinct was, and I bought it back then, and I used it up until she was murdered a couple of months ago. First instinct, you know what? I paid it off. I need to go get a new car. I need to go do this. But how many of you know just because you can doesn't mean you should? Sometimes there needs to be delayed gratification so they can be long-term success. See, I had a car, but a new car is a need or a want. So I drove that thing until she was murdered, rest in peace. And what I mean by that, I was on the way over here uh, to preach, and some lady plowed into me on the, my rear quarter panel and sent me spinning down like Tokyo Drift. Hey, I came back and I preached, amen. Didn't stop me from preaching. Didn't stop me from coming to church. But the point I was saying, driving this car, I, did I want a new car at times? Of course I did. But the point is, doing that and managing that enabled me to have leftovers. Enabled me to have financial freedom in other areas. Discipline equals freedom. You discipline yourself in the area of finances, you're going to have freedom in other areas. And that means practicing restraint. Just because you can, don't mean you should. So, once you determine, okay, my money is going towards needs versus wants. You start tracking every dollar. I want to also encourage you, start focusing on managing your money towards needs versus wants, but pay off debt. You start laying off the wants, guess what? It's going to free you up to pay debt off. Pull your credit report. That's all quiet in here. <laughs> if I'm not, I bet you under that mask you're like, Pull your credit report. Look at where you're in debt in. Look at where you're in debt in. Pay the small debt, small debts off first. Then tackle the big ones. The reason why I say you don't want to tackle the big ones first is because you're going to set yourself up for failure and and, and you're going to discourage yourself and you're going to take on too much too soon. But when you pay off the little debts first, it builds psychological momentum so that hey, this feels good. I'm paying off the $200, the $500, the $1,000. So when it comes time for you to tackle the bigger mountains of debt, you already have that momentum, and you know what it feels like to pay something off. How many of y'all ever been debt-free or been paid yourself out of debt? How many of y'all know it feels good when you do that? Amen? But you can have that too. You can have, you can do it. You're not a Mexican, you're a Mexican. (laughs) You can do it, but it's going to take, it's not going to happen by accident. Just like the multiplication did not happen by accident. It happened when there was order. It happened when they put, when they, when something was given. Now, as you pay off your debt, I want to encourage you to build an emergency fund. The way you determine what you need in an emergency fund is look at all the expenses you make per month. Needs, not wants, okay? (laughs) And multiply that. So once you determine, okay, all my needs cost, is this certain, I've totaled all my needs per, per month, and this is how much it, I need, necessities per month, then multiply that times six. And what you want to do, you're going to get that amount, that is the absolute amount you want to have in a checking account for a rainy day. Put in a high interest checking so that as it's waiting and it's liquefied, it's gaining interest. Your money is making money for you without you having to be there. Okay, amen. But you want to have it there. And some of you, and, and, and minimum, and this is D- Dave Ramsey stuff, and this stuff I've practiced in my own life. Minimum, if you cannot, uh, uh, you may, you know, six months is too much up front, then strive to have at least minimum $2,000 in your emergency fund that you don't touch. 
Drinks, drinks with the girls, don't touch it. Eating out, don't touch it. New dress, don't touch it. New gun, don't touch it. PS5 finally becomes available. Or you buy, buy one off from your homeboy that stole one, don't touch it. Because you have it there for the unexpected emergencies. That's what it's for, emergency fun. And some of you say, there, Pastor, there's no way I can do that. It's funny how, I want to tell you, you're more capable than what you think you are of doing that. It's funny how $2,000, $2, that's too much. But we have no problem, we'll drop 500 one night at Kickapoo. Two thousand, that's out. The devil is a liar. I don't know. I don't talk like that. I don't know. I don't know if anyone talks like that in here. I'm just, just going with the flow here. But we'll drop $150 on shots and alcohol. Two thousand dollars, that minimum is way too high, but spend a thousand dollars on a purse when it's real. You know, not the flea market. Well, you don't have to spend a thousand dollars to go to the flea market. Hey, Trader Joe's got you, or was it Trader's Village? Right? <laughs> you won't get the Nike. You'll get the Yikey. You'll get the Jordans, but you'll have the, like the, the booty and the okay. It's it's too much. But then, if you look at your bank statement, you spend four hundred dollars eating out per month. How many of y'all know? Or you'll spend a thousand dollars or five thousand on cars and rims and all that. How many of y'all know when you look at it from that perspective? How many of y'all know it's not far, it's not out of your reach. You can do it. You can have that emergency fund safe. How much different? How much less stress would have there been in your life had you had an emergency fund when the pipes broke? How much less? How much? Uh, less of stress would there have been when you had the emergency fund when you lost your job? How much less stress would there have been when, when you got sick and you couldn't work had you had an emergency fund? And, it's in, and, and, and you know, with this type of teaching, people get upset, but this is the reality. And if, if, you've, if it hasn't happened to you, and how many of y'all know if you live long enough, you're going to go through something like that. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. But when you prepare ahead, you'll be ready for that rainy day. It'll be your umbrella, your roof for that rainy day. If all you eat, if all your food tastes good, then you ain't eating healthy enough. And I know this don't taste good. But I know, how many of y'all know this is what builds healthy believers? This, see, I don't want a church where we can have good church, good online service, and then we're, we leave church and people are broke. People are struggling. People can't be a blessing to others. I want you to be blessed in the church, blessed in your house, blessed in your finances. I want you just don't have enough but leftovers. I want to see multiplication in your life. Not against you. I'm for you. It's not about what I want from you. It's what I want for you. How many of y'all want to be blessed? How many of y'all want just to not be making it by but have more than enough? Ha leave some leftovers for your family when you leave this earth. Church, I don't care the color of your skin, how many degrees you have, whether you have curly hair, wavy hair, not that that matters, but we're all going to die. And, and, and unless we're here when Jesus comes again, we're all going to leave this earth. And thank God if you got the Holy Spirit in you and you've made a choice to follow Jesus, because when you leave this earth, you're going to be in a place where there is no suffering, there is no sickness, there is no evil, there is per perpetual perfection in a place called heaven where the streets are made of gold. Jesus is there. You'll be reunited with loved ones, with the mom or dad or the child that you've lost. And for me, I'll be reunited with my dogs and my mom, all my pet bulls I've lost. <laughs> it's it, it's going it's, it's to be an amazing day for you. But what are you leaving to the loved ones behind when you leave this earth? Guys, I, I lost my mom when she was 48, 49 years old. I was very young when I lost her. 
and it's already stressful psychologically, emotionally, physically when you lose someone, then on top of that, if there was nothing in place, you got to figure out how is it going to, how is it going to, stuff's going to get paid. It, it's going to happen whether you think, whether you want to hear this or not. And I want you guys to be prepared. Let me ask you this. If you were to die today, if you were to die tomorrow, thank God you'll be in heaven. Praise God. But what will you leave your family behind? Unpaid hospital bills because of no insurance? Thousands of dollars in debt? A house in foreclosure? What are you going, an unpaid funeral, what are you going to leave behind? Let me show you, let me put some scripture on this. Proverbs 13 verse 22 says, A good man or woman leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Guys, I want to encourage you. One of the ways you can have something in place is you have life insurance. And especially if you're 20-something years old, raise your hand. <laughs> if you're really 20-something years old, raise your hand. You guys have it the best right now. Right now is the best time for you to get life insurance because your body hasn't had the check engine light come on yet. <laughs> any 30-year-old, any 40-year-old 40 40 year can, can testify and give me an amen? Online audience, how many of y'all know the check engine light comes on in the 30s and the 40s? and It's all downhill from there. The thing why I'm saying that 20-somethings is that it's harder to get life insurance when there's something wrong with you. And right now, it's the best time to do it. The only thing that's wrong with you right now is acne. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, or who's gonna, who you're going to date or who's DMing you or whatever. But right now is the best time to do it. But the, the point I'm trying to make, whether you're young or old, you have an opportunity that when you leave here, you're going to be in heaven. But guess what? My wife is taken care of. My children are taken care of. And I got enough left behind that I can put them in a different financial trajectory than I, what you grew up in. Life insurance is not for the dead. It's for those you leave behind. So I want to encourage you, think ahead. It's not if, it's a matter of when. There will be an emergency. There will be, we all will die unless Jesus comes. Proverbs 13, verse 16, before we go to our last point. A wise man thinks ahead. A fool doesn't and even brags about it. You ever met somebody like that? Hey, so what do you do if you were to lose this? Ah, Charlie, I'll sell drugs. <laughs> My, my girlfriend will support me. They brag about it. Oh, nothing. Or is all, well, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Nothing's going to happen to me. The Holy Ghost will take care of me. Can't be so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good. We want to make sure that we are realistic and we are prepared. Just like Christ, when those leftovers happen, hey, we ain't throwing these leftovers away. There could be another emergency. Another emergency. There could be another crisis. And disciples, guess what? When that happens, we're going to be ready. And guess what? When the crisis comes, when the loss happens, when the death happens, guess what? You will be ready. Number three. Just because you're a giver doesn't mean you won't ever go through seasons of lack. How do we know? Because Jesus, <laughs> planner of planner, the giver of givers, is here. So he began to thank God. He lifted it up and he began to bless God. He didn't say, God, ha, give me a new car. Ha, give me a new house. Ha, give me a new job. He, he didn't say no to that multiplication. He began to bless God. I'm talking about God. He began to thank him for the little that he had. In other words, God, it may not be much, but I thank you anyhow, anyway. Yeah. 
Here's what I'm trying to get to. Whenever you're going through a season of lack, always practice thankfulness unto God. Thankfulness enables multiplication. There will be times, no matter how much you plan, how much you budget, how much you give, you will go through a season of lack where you have inadequate resources. The need your loss has created is greater than the amount of strength that you have right now. The stress that losing your job has created is greater than the amount of patience you have right now. The responsibilities that have been thrown upon you, you had no control, you just had to take it, is greater than the time you have to give. When this happens, rather than getting bitter or getting angry or pulling ourselves away from God, how many of y'all know we ought to be like Christ? And in the midst of what we are lacking, begin to thank God and begin to praise God. And I'm not just talking about financial needs. Leftovers are not the whole. They're part of the original. Some of you are dealing with the leftover memories of losing a loved one. Leftover bills because you changed jobs and you have no left, nothing left over to provide. Going through a sickness, now all you have is leftovers from the time your health used to be whole. Not just whole parts, but leftovers. Marriage ended in divorce, now all you got is leftover pain, memories, and anger, and bills. Can I get a witness? I just want to encourage you, like Christ, to begin to thank Him in the midst of of everything that you have in the midst of you having in the midst of you lacking begin to thank God see when you begin to thank God it shifts your focus it shifts your focus because when 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 there is lack and and when there's this when there's crisis what does it do all we see is what's missing and what we don't have and what we're lacking and who's no longer here and that is the reality and you need to address that and see that I'm in no way or form or fashion am I saying to ignore that but when you begin to thank Him in the midst of what you lack, it shifts your focus to not only seeing what you don't have or, no, or who no longer is here, but it enables you to see what you still got and who's still here and what you're still blessed and, it, and, and reminds you that you're a lot more blessed than what you think you are. And when you begin to bless Him in the middle of lack, little becomes multiplied when you surrender it to God. The little strength to endure gets multiplied into much because God starts to give you his strength. The little happiness you have gets multiplied into much because now God gives you his joy and the joy of the Lord is your strength. The little peace you have becomes much because God gives you his peace and he gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding. He doesn't give you circumstantial peace, but in the midst of your sickness, you have peace. In the midst of the job loss, you have peace. In the midst of a divorce, you got peace. In the midst of losing a loved one, you got peace. The peace that where you're shaken, but you're not moved because Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost is your anchor. The Bible says... That God will provide all our needs according to his riches. God's not broke. God don't deal from low self-esteem. He don't have a 420 credit score. He's not confused. He didn't got to go to a loan company and take out a payday loan with a 30% interest. God is rich, and I'm not just talking about and, 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 and money because we think money. Some of y'all don't need money, but God is rich in forgiveness. If you've fallen away and have a lot of sins and darkness in your life, God is rich in grace. God is rich in peace. Some of you don't need money because you got no peace in your home. You have no peace in your marriage, but we serve the God whose peace surpasses all understanding. Some of you, he's rich in faith. Some of you, you don't need money. You got all the money, but you got no, you have no joy. You have no happiness, but 
that I serve the Jesus Christ, the Jesus who died on the cross for you and I, who died to give you joy, this joy that, that relationships cannot give you, no car can give you, no house can give you, no job position can give you, but it's only the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that can give us joy and strength when we feel like giving up, but it happens when we begin to thank God in the midst of our lack. Guys, of course we should thank God at all times. But sometimes we forget to thank Him even when, we're, when there's little. I heard someone say, if you go out looking for the bad, it's there. But if you go out looking for the good, that's also there. I want every head bowed here. If you're watching online, I want you to bow your head. I'm asking you this. I know your, your heart is broken, it's shattered. No, there must be frustration and anger and maybe stress from all the responsibilities and just the change that you're going through. You're sick, maybe. But right there where you're at, not the pastor. You just heard me talk. Maybe longer than what you wanted to hear me talk. But that's okay. But right there where you're at. I want you to open your mouth. Don't worry about what your neighbor is going to think behind, behind you. Don't worry what the person next to you is going to think. But I want you to open your mouth right now at the count of three and just begin to thank God. You don't got to wait to the count of three, but begin to thank God. Shift your focus. Are you ready? Begin to thank Him. I, I know you're lacking patience. Begin to thank God. You're lacking peace, begin to thank God. You're lacking money, begin to thank God. You're lacking joy and happiness, begin to thank God. You're lacking support, begin to thank God. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come on, just thank God right there. Right Open your mouth. Don't worry about what people are going to think. They ain't going to give you peace. Jesus can don't worry about people are going to think they didn't die on the cross for you. Jesus did. Begin to thank him right there. Father, we thank you. You died on the cross. We got air in our lungs. You woke us up here today, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Father, that it's been a, a tough last year and already tough this year, but yet we're still standing, we're still alive, and we still have time to fight, to strive. We thank you for giving us strength when we had no strength. We thank you when we wanted to quit. You didn't let us quit. We thank you when we were sick in our bodies. You, 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 you healed us. We thank you when people abandoned us, rejected us, lied on us, unfaithful to us. We thank you, Lord God, that you were the one who had our back. You were the faithful when people were unfaithful. You ran to us when others ran from us. We thank you mighty name of Jesus. Come on, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Come on, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord with a, a thank you, Jesus. A bless the Lord with a clapping of hands. Come on, somebody. We've talked about praise and worship. Bless the Lord with the opening of your mouth. Don't worry if you can't sing. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Don't worry if you can sing or not. Come on, I wish somebody would praise God in this place and begin to thank Him in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of your divorce, in the midst of not having a job, in the midst of losing a loved one. Begin to thank Him. Begin to thank God right now in this place. Little becomes much. Little becomes much. The discouraged get encouraged. The weak become strong when there is thankfulness. The ungrateful become grateful when there's thankfulness. Come on. Open your mouth. We worship you. We praise you. We give you the thanks. We love you, Lord. Our best is not behind us. It's ahead of us in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, give the Lord a hand clap. Not trying to stir anybody up, but sometimes you got to stir yourself up.
The Bible said when David lost everything, he lost his family and his village and his livelihood. The Bible said that people began to break down, but David began to encourage himself. And how many of y'all know what we don't need sometimes is someone to lay hands on us. We just need to encourage ourselves, tell ourselves, self, you're going to get through this. Self, you're going to make it. Self, you're not going to be a victim, but you're going to be a victor. Self, this sickness will not take you out. You may die of something. You may die somewhere, but you will not die of this. Come on, somebody, encourage yourself. Talk to yourself. Preach to yourself. Lay hands on yourself. That's all I got to say about that. Guys, how many of you are blessed by today's message? If, if I bring a trusted financial advisor to this church, how many of you would be interested, and raise your hand because I need a survey, how many of you would be interested in taking some information and talking to him about bettering yourself and taking the first step? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Amen. Give yourselves a hand for those of you who raised your hand. Uh, maybe my bring in brother Kurt. Brother Kurt is retired. Retired Navy. Is a financial advisor. And the man does not even step a foot. He does not attend our church. But yet the man is always giving and supporting and tithing to this church. How many of y'all thank God for people like that? I've known him for quite a while. But let's see if we can get him in. And we get him in, we will announce so you guys can partake of that. How many of you are blessed? Come on.